Hi, welcome to this MCQ Revision Bass. We're going to be looking at research methods in this short multiple choice questions. How they work is there's going to be 15 different questions. I'm going to pop a question onto the slide and read through it. I suggest you pause it, give yourself a bit of time to think about the answer. I'll reveal the answer, then I'll give you a bit of detail about that particular answer. Good luck. Question one. A researcher wanted to establish if there was a difference between male and female performance on the psychology test. Is this A, a field experiment, B, a quasi-experiment, or C, a natural experiment? So pause your video. Your correct answer there is B. So just a heads up on your specification, laboratory field natural and quasi are named as the experimental methods that you're required to know. What we have here is an example of a quasi experiment, and this is something that students often struggle with. A quasi experiment basically means that in terms of allocating to the different groups of the independent variable, I can't do it using, let's say, random allocation. The reason for that is there are particular features of an individual that I can't change that will determine which condition they're in. So, for example, in the um, stem here, we've got the difference between males and females. I can't randomly allocate to that groups because they will either be a male or a female. Question two. In one, the participant knows that they are being observed, whereas in the other, the participant does not know that they are being observed. What difference does this describe? Is it the difference between naturalistic and controlled observations, participant and non-participant observations, over and covert observations, or time sampling and event sampling? Pause your video. Your correct answer here is overt and covert, because of course in overt observations people know they're being observed and covert, like the word undercover if you like, people don't know that they're being observed. Now all of these that I've put on the slide here, A, B, C and D, are named on the specification uh, within the context of observations, so you will have to know what each of them are, as well as being able to describe how they might be used, and also the advantages and disadvantages of each of them. Question 3. A coefficient of 0 0.7 would be A. A strong negative correlation B. A weak negative correlation C. A strong positive correlation or D. A weak positive correlation Pause your video. Your correct answer there is C, so a strong positive correlation. Now, the value there of 0 0.7, like we said, is referred to as a coefficient. You are required to know what coefficients are. So, for example, you might get a question that had an image of a scattergram and you'd be required to comment on, perhaps from a series of options, what the coefficient of that could be. So the idea of a coefficient, of course, is that they fall from anywhere between minus one and one. The closer they are to the value of one, the stronger the correlation. So a coefficient, for example, that would be minus 0 0.9 is a very strong, uh, very strong negative correlation, and that's 0.9 would be a very strong positive correlation. Um, there is no correlation that would be around the kind of zero figure, which just indicates that there isn't a relationship, or that at least there doesn't seem to be a relationship between those variables. Question four. What is the DV in this research? A researcher wanted to see if there was a difference in the time it took two groups of dogs to run a maze. He gave half of the dogs a performance enhancing drug and compared the times with the normal dogs. So I want the dependent variable. Is it A, whether the dogs were given drugs, B, the type of drug given, C, time, or D, time taken in seconds to complete the maze? Pause your video. Right, your correct answer there is D. Now, the reason it's D and not C is because C is what we say. It's not an operationalized dependent variable. So when I'm giving my dependent variable, I'm going to make sure that it's presented in a format that's measurable. So time taken in seconds is measurable, whereas time, you might argue, is a little bit ambiguous in terms of being a dependent variable. You might have spot that A and B are just variations given there of the independent variable, arguably though neither of those is correctly operationalized. Question five. 
What would be a non-directional hypothesis for this research? A researcher wanted to see if there was a difference in the time it took two groups of dogs to run a maze. He gave half the dogs a performance enhancing drug and compared the times with the other normal dogs. So we've got the same stem as before, but this time I'm looking for which of A and B is the non-directional hypothesis for this piece of research. So pause your video. Right, the correct answer that I'm looking for there is B. So I did ask you for a non-directional hypothesis. You may have spotted that A there was actually the directional hypothesis. Remember the difference between a non-directional hypothesis and a directional hypothesis is that a directional hypothesis makes an exact prediction about what is going to happen, whereas a non-directional hypothesis just states that something is likely to happen. It's also very useful for you to think about why a researcher might choose to use a non-directional or a directional hypothesis for their particular piece of research. It tends to be the case that in research where there is some idea, perhaps because of previous research, of what the outcome might be, a researcher might choose to use a directional hypothesis. But if you're in a particular new field of research, then a non-directional hypothesis is far more appropriate. Question six. In a set of data, the following values are given. The mean is 10, the mode is 12, and the median is 11. What type of distribution is this? Is it A, a normal distribution, B, a positive skew, C, a negative skew, or D, what? <laughs> Watch your video. OK, now the correct answer that we're looking for there is a negative skew. And this is a potential type of question that you could get where you're given values of the mean, median and mode and asked to comment on what type of di distribution it is. Now, if the mean, median and mode are the same, that denotes a normal distribution. And what I've done here is I've just put on a couple of grasps here just to explain kind of how you work this out. So if we just look at that, the C, which is the answer, so the negative skew graph there, and you'll see the mode, the mode is always going to be the peak because the mode is the most common score. Now in a negative skew, what we have is we have a mean value that is less than the mode value. Now, on the other side, with the positive skew, we have the reverse. We have a mean value which is higher than the modal value. So just remembering that rule is a good way, should you come across a question where you're given the mean, median and mode and has to comment on the type of distribution just to remember what they are. Simply just by remembering the position of the mode and the mean and knowing that the median will always fall in the middle of those two values. Next question seven, look at the results in this table, which comment about standard deviation is correct? A, in group one, there is much more variation in the results. This means that the participant scores are likely to be very different. B, in group two, there is much more variation in the results. This means that the participant scores are likely to be very different. So pause your video. Right, the correct answer there is B. So in group two, and let's take a look at group two. So in group two, we've got a standard deviation there of 5.7. And the comment we've made is there's much more variation in the results. This means participant scores are likely to be very different. Now I've just popped a comment, a uh, little text box there of what standard deviation actually is. So we've got the standard deviation looks at how far the scores deviate from the mean. If the standard deviation is large, this suggests that the data is very dispersed. So what that means is, for example, if you do a particular experiment and every individual in that experiment in group one, let's say scores 10, the standard deviation will be zero. Standard deviation of zero basically means all scores are the same. So what that means is the larger the standard deviation, the more variability there's going to be in your data set. So when commenting on standard deviation, it's often the case that you're given a couple to compare and it will simply be the case of the larger value having more variation and the smaller value having less variation. Question eight, a paradigm shift is when scientists don't agree, B, a shared set of assumptions and methods. C, when the paradigm shifts from one to another. D, when an accepted way of thinking about something is replaced by a new one. Correct answer I'm looking for, D. 
OK, so I mean, A, there when scientists don't agree, you could argue is how paradigm shifts um, come about. B, which is a shared set of assumptions and methods, is simply a description there of a paradigm. C, when the paradigm shifts from one to another, is a very, very poor description of paradigm shift using the word paradigm shift uh, in the answer. So paradigm shifts, like we know, is kind of when science goes good if you like, because you have a paradigm, which is an accepted way of thinking. People share this way of thinking in science. Perhaps new researchers come along, they start to bring in new ideas, and then we get A, scientists don't agree. Uh, and then eventually what we might see is a change where an old paradigm, a particular way of thinking, is then replaced by a new, arguably better way of thinking. Nine. What is the difference between a population and a sample? A, the population is who is in the general public and the sample is the people that take part in the research. B, the population is the particular subgroup to be studied, whereas the sample is the individual used to represent that subgroup. Pause the video. Right, your correct answer there is B. You are required to know the difference between a population and a sample. It's actually named on the specification and a lot of students struggle. Um, the sample of individuals are basically the people in your research and the population is the people that those individuals are supposed to represent. Lots of students use the term in part of an evaluation, let's say, uh, the sample is unrepresentative. What they mean when they say the sample is unrepresentative is that it may not reflect the target population being studied. So it's almost like you do know the difference between them. Perhaps you just didn't know that you know the difference between them. Then, what type of validity is being described here? If psychologists are wanting to introduce a new measure of depression, they may compare their results to the data obtained from a measure that is very similar, such as Beck's depression inventory. Is that A, temporal validity, B, ecological validity, C, face validity, or D, concurrent validity? Pause the video. Correct answer that we're looking for there for is concurrent validity. So what we've got here is the different ways of expressing validity that are named on your specification. We can refer to temporal and ecological uh, being methods of assessing external validity. And then we've got face and concurrent validity, uh, which are ways of commenting about the assessment of validity. So if we're talking about face validity as an assessment of validity, for example, you might say, let's say I make a question to measure depression, the question of face validity is to take a look at that questionnaire and just making sure that, yeah, on the face of it, it seems to be doing what it's supposed to be doing. Question 11. Which of these statements about peer review are not correct? And I'd like you to select two of these. A. Peer reviewers are experts. B. Peer reviewers are paid. C. Peer reviewers check the research with ethical. D. Peer reviews comment on the originality of research. So pause your video. Right, the correct answer here is B and C. And put this question in because it's a common misconception among students about what peer reviewers do and indeed why they do it. Peer reviewers are not paid to review an article. The reason that they do it is because it's very flattering to be asked to be a peer reviewer. After all, peer reviewers are experts in a particular field. It's also not the job of a peer review to comment on the ethics of research, of course. That's the job of the BPS or whatever ethical approval board the researcher is using. What they are there to do, of course, is to comment on the originality of the research, and that's just one of their jobs. They, for example, also might want to look at the methods that have been used by the researcher and whether or not those methods are appropriate. So like I said, the point of that question is just to correct a common misperception amongst students about what peer review is. 12. Which of these two statements describe what a type 2 error is? A. When the researcher accepts their experimental hypothesis when they should have rejected it. B. When a researcher rejects their experimental hypothesis when they should have accepted it. So which of those is type 2 please? Pause your video. Right, the correct answer that I'm looking uh, for there is B. So in a type 1 error, you accept your experimental hypothesis and of course in doing so, you reject the null hypothesis. 
in a type two error, you reject your experimental and then you accept your null. So you often might see, for example, a type one error occur, perhaps when the level of significance that we're using is a little bit too lenient. And on the reverse, we might see a type two error occurring when we're using a level of significance that's particularly strict. Question 13, which one of the statements about using the Mann-Whitney test is incorrect? A, it's used when looking for a difference, B, an unrelated design, or C, interval data. Pause the video. Okie dokie, your correct answer there is C. We probably already thought, no, Mann-Whitney just has to be at least ordinal level there for the data. Uh, just to clarify, on B, we've used the term unrelated design. That is a term that we'd use when describing the particular tests. An unrelated design simply refers to the use of the independent measures design, whereas if we use the term related design, we'd be referring to the use of match pairs um, or repeated measures. Question 14, which of these statements about using the related t-test is incorrect? A, use when looking for a correlation. B, a related design. C, interval data. Pause your video. Now, the clue there in terms of whether or not B is correct is obviously in the name of the test itself, the related t-test. And then of course you've got its mate, the unrelated t-test. So the related t-test, of course, is used when you've got a repeated measures or match pairs design. It's used when you've got interval data and also when you're looking for a difference. Last question here, 15. Which of these statements are incorrect? And I'd like you to pick two. In the sign test, the observed value is S. In chi-squared, DF is used, not N. C, for the Wilcoxon test, there must be a similar variance in both conditions. D, you have to be able to calculate all the tests. Which two are wrong? All right, it's C and D. We'll start off with D because this is one that gets so many students in a model. The only test that you may be asked to calculate using the step-by-step -step process that you have learned is the sign test. That is the only test. You may well be asked to, with the other tests, um, comment on their use. That's to say you might be given an observed value for a particular test, a table of critical values, asked to state whether or not a result is significant. So students often get themselves in the panic. So in terms of the actual calculation of the test, it's only the sign test that you are required to know the steps of. Now for C there, when we've talked about similar variance in both conditions, some of your more shrewd statisticians may realise that that's actually a point that's related to the unrelated t-test and the related t-test, because it's one of the reasons or the justifications in terms of using them is having similar variance in both conditions, as is also the idea that the population needs to be drawn from a normal distribution. All right, so that was just a quick fire blast there. I hope it's been useful in clarifying some extra points that maybe you didn't know. There's lots of study notes from Tutor to you. We also have another research methods MCQ blast on here that you might want to have a go at, as well as MCQ blasts for all of the other topics. So good luck.